Dear Lord, we thank you so much for such a beautiful day today and for the summer that's headed our way. Please keep us back here and centered to you throughout the summer, even though it's beautiful and we want to maybe be outside doing other things. Bring us all back here still to you. And we thank you for your freedom, for our freedom to worship you like this. Not everybody has such freedom. And we thank you for the offerings. May they be put to good use to further your kingdom. Amen. Okay, let's stand and sing some praises.
prayer. I don't have any, nobody gave me any updates. So I'm assuming we're good there. Uh, give us clean hands. And we've got Psalm 24 that I'm going to read. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob.
and to serve you in the way that we show that love, uh, not only to Christians, but to non-Christians. Uh, Father, we know that as a church, uh, many people look to us as examples, and so uh, it's, a, it's a difficult task, and Father, well, we need to be uh, those, the people that uh, can show the light, show the way to others. Uh, we just thank you for this church in Weymouth and, and for the uh, the influence that it has in the community and not only that but uh, the many gifts and abilities that have been showered upon the people of this of this church and, and it's only because of you Father that we can come and we can serve you in different ways and we all have different abilities but uh, I pray that you would help us to find ways that we can use our abilities to serve you and I thank you so much for those that are doing that now. And I pray that we would never take it for granted because uh, sometimes we have a tendency to do that. To help us to reach out and uh, give a word of thanks and recognition once in a while to those who are using their abilities and talents for, for the church. And Father, uh, we pray that we be with Carol and Amanda as they enjoy a little bit of time off and vacation time and as they travel uh, through Cape Breton, I pray that they would have some good weather and really be able to relax and enjoy it and come back with uh, renewed energy. And we thank you for the influence that they have here uh, and for the blessing that they are to this community and for the blessing they are to this church. And Father, as we continue to worship you, we, we pray that our worship would be in truth and in spirit that our worship would be acceptable to you, Father, and that you would uh, bless us as we continue to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
On Saturday, we'll be celebrating the 150th anniversary of Canada's Confederation. And I'm sure that you'll agree that Canada is a great place to live, one where we can enjoy many things that aren't available in other countries. One of these things is the freedom to gather here today in this, in this house of worship to give open expression to our faith in God. People everywhere, people everywhere can know and enjoy the spiritual freedom we have in Christ, whatever the political climate of the country where they live. This freedom was made possible by Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection. He has set us free from the bondage of sin and death. This freedom becomes ours personally when we put our faith in Jesus and we are obedient to him. We maintain this freedom for the proper use of it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, but rather serve one another in love. You are not free to sin, you are free to love and to serve one another. And we come to this table to remember the price that was paid for our freedom, Jesus' death upon the cross, and to give thanks for his sacrifice. I ask you to join me in prayer. Kind of loving Heavenly Father, we, we know that you're almighty and, and all-seeing God. We thank you for the sacrifice uh, of your Son on the cross for the remission of our sins. We ask now your blessing on the cup and the loaf we're about to receive, symbols of, of his body and blood that was spilled on the cross. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And maybe Stephen will even like dance his way up. <laughs> Sermon, 
Um, we haven't done this for a while, so we're kind of getting out of touch. But uh, last week, Daryl inspired me and he brought a bunch of donuts. So I thought, well, I'm always teaching on food. Maybe I'll teach on donut, you know, somewhere along the way of how you live your life without Jesus. You're like an old fashioned donut with a hole in the middle. Something's missing. Or if you live your life with Jesus and you're like that great Boston cream filled donut with all the goodness in the middle. So I had that all in my head and I thought, well, if I do that, then I got to bring donuts. <laughs> and I probably shouldn't have donuts two weeks in a row. So I scrapped that idea. Then Tracy said, why don't you preach on summer? I love summer, let's do summer. So I started looking up with some ideas on summer, but everything was on the seasons in your life and stuff, and I was getting kind of depressed reading everything, and I said, I don't know if I can really handle that one either. So I scrapped that idea, and instead I did a summer devotion for a Sunday school this morning, which seemed to be okay, but it did bring treats. So I think some of you got the treats. They went on to the other class and packed them up there. So then I settled, and I thought, well, you know what? A uh, special girl is graduating this year. We really love Emma. She's almost like one of our other daughters. So I said, I'm, I'm going to look up something and I found the sermon that I was going to do on graduation. So I always go searching for my ideas and find some sermon stuff and then I tweak it and make my own and get it all ready. Then when I'm done, I present it to Tracy and she kind of critiques it and tells me how bad it is, how good it is and everything, right? So she's reading the stuff and this was two days ago that everything done. She said, um... You realize Emma works Sunday, right? I said, no, I didn't. So I'm actually preaching to her and she's not even here. So she's the only graduate we got, so you guys just got to pretend that you're graduating this year. And it's kind of a theme for everybody anyway, so it, it'll be fine. We'll, we'll get through it. So make it through 12 years of high school, or if you're going through college, 16 plus years of college, of grad, Gabby's learning that now. It involves facing quite a few very real challenges. And as we can all testify, making it through life itself includes continuous encounters with challenges that we must meet. But the wonderful thing about confronting all these challenges is that we've already faced some very good victories in our past and we got those under our belt. Just think, we all encountered some experience with success through all these stuff in the past. You graduated out of your mother's womb and successfully adjusted to life in the outside world, or most of us have. You graduated from being a little infant and successfully began that first day of kindergarten. You graduated from being a pre-adolescent and successfully navigated those teen years. And now, graduates, they believe, you graduated from high school or college and you're ready to travel that road through adulthood. How can you continue to have success, and how can that be assured as you go through this next step? We're going to look at three guidelines from God's Word to help provide guidance for you and everybody else gathered here today to make it through the next step in your life. First, I'm going to have a little short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. As Mark said, it's wonderful to see the sun shine. We're thankful for the people that are here today. We're thankful for Daryl and Amanda. We just ask you to be with them as they travel and enjoy their time off and bring them safely back with us next week. Thank you for the many blessings that you give us, and we're grateful for your words. We just ask you to bless us here today and be with us today as we get a little bit deeper into your word. Thank you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. We've all been there. Me, me especially this morning. Your heart begins to pan rapidly. You have a little bit of a shortness of breath. You have a difficulty swallowing. Your knees are kind of weak and shaking. Your hands are cold, but you've never been so hot in your life. You're sweating, you probably started already. <laughs> what I'm describing is some of the psychological reactions that people have when they're getting ready to get up and talk in front of a crowd for the first time. Or you haven't done it for a while, which is what I'm facing. One of the greatest hazards to success for anything is fear. Well, not all fear is bad, like fear of snakes and stuff we talked about this morning, right, Doug? <laughs> Everyone knows what it's like to be afraid of something. But when fear mobilizes you and keeps you from doing something that you've been called to do, that's being dominated by a spirit of fear. That kind of fear paralyzes us and keeps us from doing stuff that we should be doing or could be doing. With this in mind, I'm going to give you the very first guideline to success. The first one is face your fears. I'm going to have three scriptures, 
This first one is 2 Timothy 1, 7. The Bible is full of all kinds of fear nots. But this is a good verse because it's written to a young man, perhaps just a little bit older than what Emmy would be, a little bit older than what a graduate would be. Timothy is a young pastor in the church of Ephesus, and the Apostle Paul was his mentor. Paul encouraged Timothy in his very first letter to not let others intimidate him just because he's so young. Timothy was afraid of being inadequate as such a young preacher. He lacked self-confidence, and in his second letter to Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy that any cowardice in his life doesn't call from God's Spirit. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the Spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. When we trust Jesus as our Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our life, and provides the continuous comfort that we need to help eliminate all our fears. With God in control of our lives, we can face our fears. He gives us the ability to do what life demands, to love what other people hate, and to be under control when we throw restraint to the wind. Max Lucado says, Fear doesn't want you to make the journey to the mountain. If he can rat you enough, fear will persuade you to take your eyes off of the peaks and settle for a lowly existence down in the flatlands. Living far away from home can be fearful sometimes. Maybe you do like give her a copy of this and make her read it. Be homework. Going in for a job interview can be traumatic. Not having friends or care about you can be devastating. But God has not given us a spirit of fear. It's God's will to move us from fear to confidence. We are called to live courageously and to trust the enablement of God's Spirit, even though some of you may be young. Most of you are all young. We'll say you're all young. Some of you are really young. Maybe inexperienced. You may even be a little bit afraid. We can call on God's Spirit to help work in us and through us. God can and will use your life, but you must be willing to face your fears. Saying yes to Jesus Christ when you're on a college campus is a courageous thing when you're faced with the fear of being a stereotype. Saying yes to a godly lifestyle when you're in a difficult job is a courageous thing while facing the fear of being ridiculed. Saying no to drugs and parties that you're going to be invited to is a courageous thing to face if you face the fear of being alone. Saying yes to honesty and integrity in an academic environment is a courageous thing in the face of failing a bag with a bad grade. One of the biggest battles you'll face is the battle for honesty. Dishonesty is rooted in fear. A rancher asked a veterinarian for some free advice. I have a horse. Walks normally sometimes and then limps sometimes. What should I do with it? The veterinarian replied, next time it walks normally, sell it. <laughs> Dishonesty is the norm today. It takes courage to be honest on a resume, or not to cheat on an exam, or to be fair in your business. Face your fear of a poor grade, or of not getting the job, or of losing a profit if necessary. Knowing that God has promised the necessary power and love and self-control to help you get the job done, even if you have to stand alone. They conducted tests by a university on kids of different ages where 10 students were placed in a room. On the board, they put three different lines of varying lengths, a short one, a medium one, and a long one. They asked the students to raise their hands when the instructor pointed to the longest line. Nine out of 10 of the students in the classroom had been told ahead of time to raise their hand when he pointed to the second longest line. So of course, when he points to the longest line, one student raises his hand, the other nine don't. He looks around, sees nobody else raise their hand, puts his hand down. This happened in 75% of the cases for varying ages, kids from very young up to very old. They determined that many people would rather stand with the majority, even though they knew it was wrong, they didn't want to be alone, than they would of being right and standing all by themselves. This is the time, Emma, 
when you're faced with some of the fears squarely and you have to have a strong confidence in God and you never, ever, ever take your eyes off of the crab, take your cues from the crab and take your eyes off what you know is right. So, if fears don't keep us from navigating life, then maybe an inappropriate response to failures might. Our second point is, forget your failures. And that's from Philippians 3, 12 to 14. This story is used many times for many different illustrations, but today I'm using it because it fits pretty good with graduates. Paul's in prison. I'm sure you know the story. He's in prison. He's changed to a Roman guard under what probably is considered to be pretty poor conditions. When he writes, not that I have already attained this, that is, I have not already been perfected, which he's saying he's not perfected to be like Christ, but I strive to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to attain this, which he means a level of maturity. Instead, I'm single-minded, forgetting the things that are behind me, which means it's a good thing, because if you know the story of Paul, previously Saul, he had many mistakes in his life, including persecuting Christians. And reaching out for things that are ahead. With this goal in mind, I strive towards the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul himself is basically enrolled in a Christ-like university where his study and his plan is try to prepare himself to live more of a life like Christ. He makes two different implications in the statement. He refuses to allow failures to become destructive in his life, and he refuses to allow failures to detour him for what his goal is, and that is to be more like Christ. His secret? He puts his past behind him, and he's determined to have a positive mental attitude in life. There will be failures. Nobody's perfect. Maybe you've all heard this saying before. The only ones who never do anything wrong are the ones who never do anything. Remember that? Amen. It's not a matter of if you fail, but when you fail. And when we fail, we have to learn from it, put it behind us, and we never, ever let the failures quit, help us quit trying. We always keep trying. In the midst of World War II, Oxford University asked the then Prime Minister Churchill to address its commencement exercises. Dressed in his very finest suit, he arrived at the auditorium where the service was to be held. With his usual props, a cigar, a cane, and a top hat. If you picture Ch Churchill, you probably get that image in your head. <coughs> As Churchill approaches the podium, the crowd rises in appreciative applause. Standing confidently before the crowd of his great admirers, he removes his cigar, takes his top hat off, and places it on the podium. Then gazing at the waiting audience that included some of the most noted scholars in the world, with an authoritative voice, any authoritative tone in his voice, he began with three words: "Never give up." Several seconds pass. Doesn't say another word. Finally, again, he says, "Never give up." There's a deafening silence. Churchill reaches for his hat, steadies himself with his cane, and leaves the podium. His commencement address was finished. Life can and will be difficult sometimes, but we can learn much from those three simple words, never give up. So finally, the last point to reach our goal, which Paul spoke of, we have to follow this last guideline. And that, to me, is the most important one. Follow your faith. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. The book of Hebrews was written to Christians who were struggling in their faith. They were wavering in their devotion to Christ because they were going through some really hard times. The writer encourages the saints not to give up, that others have been victorious, and so can we. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he's saying, listen up. Hear the people around you. Hear the voices that come before you. We must get rid of every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Lighten up your load. Clear it all the clutter in your life. And run with endurance the race that's set out before us. Following our faith isn't a game of hopscotch where we hop from one point to the other as it seems fit to us. It's a race of endurance. 
we have to realize that sometimes following our faith is more of an endurance race than it is a game. Keeping our eyes fixed on Christ, look up. If you're going to run this race and you're going to win, Christ is your focus point. So look up to Christ. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set it for him, he endured the cross, disregarded the shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Think of him who endures this opposition against himself by sinners, so that you may not grow weary in your souls and give up. The Hebrew writer established that all runners need a reference point in running a race. Ian probably can tell us that very easily. And you too, you raced it. People in a spiritual race or on this spiritual journey also need a reference point. If you're in the middle of nowhere and you have no idea where to go, for example, the first thing we do is what? What do you look for if you're lost and you're trying to find your way? What's the first thing they say you look for? Which way is? Which way is north? Once we know where north is, we can try to navigate from there. NASA illustrates this need for a reference point. On the day six of the ill-fated mission of Apollo 13, for any of you that may have watched the movie, the astronauts are needed to make a critical course correction. If they fail, they might never return to Earth. To conserve power, they need to shut down their onboard computer that helps steer the aircraft. Yet, the astronauts needed to make a 39 second burn of the main engines. So how do they steer? Astronaut Jim Lovell determined that if they could keep a fixed point in their space to view through their window in the, in the castle, they could steer the craft manually. That focal point turned out to be their destination, which was Earth. As it's shown in the 1995 movie, Apollo 13, for 39 agonizing seconds, Lovell focused on keeping the Earth in view. By not losing sight of that reference point, the three astronauts avoid disaster. Scripture reminds us that to finish our life mission successfully, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For Christians, our reference point is Jesus Christ. You can be flexible on many things on your life, and a lot of them you should be flexible. But when it comes to our true north, our Savior, and his teachings as a reference point, we can't budge from that true north. It's very easy to become distracted, especially in that first year that kids are away from home. They need to focus, remove obstacles. They need to tie into a local church or a campus ministry to help them navigate their life. Remember that there are those that have gone on before us and are always going to be part of that great cloud of witnesses that Paul talks about. And they're there rooting for you. The greatest challenge is going to be for them to follow their faith and keep focus on Jesus all the way. So to recap, face your fears, forget your failures, and follow your faith. Whether you're going on to further education, Maybe you're moving from middle school, like Jack and are in here, I can't preach them. Moving from middle school to high school, you're starting a new job, or maybe just beginning some other new adventure in your life. Remember, make sure that everything is where it needs to be between you and your Savior as you move forward in these all important transitions in your life. He is there to guide you, He will never leave your side. Take His hand, and He'll lead you through. Thank you. Sing a good, familiar
aware of your presence in the coming week. Uh, we ask that you would walk with us and that we would walk with you. Thank you for your love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.